It is truly a pleasure to be here with you today. Companies around the world are ramping up their ambitions to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But for heavy industry, including the chemical, steel, mining, and cement industries, as well as the transportation sector, eliminating greenhouse gas emissions has proven remarkably challenging. From the high heat needed to make steel and cement to the fossil fuels powering shipping and transport vessels, these hard to abate sectors currently account for around a quarter of total global greenhouse gas emissions, and that's primarily carbon dioxide. The mining sector alone accounts for four to seven percent of global emissions. This means that the decarbonization of hard to abate sectors will be a critical component of the global effort to fight climate change and curb planetary warming. Yet currently, many countries' national strategies under the Paris Agreement do not yet address these hard to abate sectors. Instead, they focus primarily on decarbonizing the power, housing, and other sectors that operate on domestic markets, leaving the decarbonization of heavy industry as an issue for the future. But as these sectors fall behind while economies decarbonize in line with the Paris Agreement, they will make up an increasingly large proportion of total global emissions. And there is yet to be a consensus on the best path forward to decarbonize these hard-to-abate sectors. Given the current limitations on the availability of clean energy technology alternatives and the long lifetimes projected for existing assets in these industries, the IEA predicts these sectors' emissions won't fall until after 2070, two decades after the critical goal set by the Paris Agreement. Fortunately, paths to decarbonization are emerging, and as science and technology evolves in tandem with growing climate ambitions, there may be even more opportunities for these sectors to align their industry practices with global climate goals. And indeed, with countries increasing regulation of emissions in order to curb temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, that goal established after the Paris Agreement, the need to lower emissions becomes ever more urgent. Still, we have a long way to go. And now, despite emergence of some exciting developments of carbon capture and storage, the use of hydrogen and market-based mechanisms such as carbon pricing, we need to do more. Now, given these daunting challenges, I'm looking forward to hearing the insights from our four distinguished panelists working at the forefront of these issues. They can give us insight into where these industries are and what's needed to devise effective strategies to achieve that carbon neutral future that all of us want. So I'm delighted to be joined by Magali Anderson, Chief Sustainability and Infra Innovation Officer at Holcim. In this capacity, she directs the global R&D efforts, emphasizing decarbonization in the industry and corporate social responsibility. We also have with us Daria Gregorov, who serves as the head of sustainability at Polyus, where she ensures sustainable development across the company. Her work encompasses environmental risk, climate change, health and safety, community development, human rights, international standards, and stakeholder relations, a very full plate. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Sheehan, Managing Partner at ETF Partners, which he co-founded in 2006. Prior to founding ETF Partners, Patrick has had a long-standing career in venture capital, helping launch Three Eyes Venture Capital Practice, and later founding and serving as Managing Director of Three Eyes Silicon Valley Operations. And finally, we are joined by Emmanuel Kakaras, Executive Vice President of Next Energy Business at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. His R&D activities include flexible operation of thermal plants, fuel cells, 
and electrolyzers and CO2 storage and utilization. So now I want to turn it over to our panelists, and I'd like to start with the first question for each of you. And that is, what is the greatest challenge in your industry with regard to decarbonization? So Magali, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to be here today. Um, I think the biggest challenge is today concrete is the second most used material after water. And if we look at the mega trend, about 2.5 billion people additional will go to urban area in the next 30 years. 60% of that infrastructure does not exist, which means we need to build a New York City every month. So there's absolutely no other choice than decarbonizing sorry, the cement and concrete world because it is needed. So today we have avenues to do it. We have um, signed our net zero pledge last year with uh, our 2030 target validated by Science Based Target Initiative. We know what to do today. We know what innovation we need to have in the future, and that includes carbon capture, usage and storage that you just mentioned. But we don't always have the capacity to do it because the norms are not necessarily um, helping us in doing it. So today we have product, we have green products on the market that we would love to deploy worldwide, but we can't for that reason. So I think my biggest challenge today would be in short, um, the scalability, how do I decarbonize that quantity of cement and concrete that we use today and we will use in the future? And how do I deploy all these green products that I already have, that I could have in the market, having all the norms and legislations allowing me, allowing me to do it? Well, thank you. Daria, are you seeing similar challenges in the gold mining industry? What's your biggest challenge in this area? Uh, hello, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I would say that uh, our main challenge would be, like to set really near-term targets and make change today, uh, because we we do re our mining peers also we do set like glo global long-term uh, targets for carbon neutrality. But the real issue would be what will be going on with the companies in the nearest like yeah. three five years. And all around that, like legislation is issues, technology issues are, are also on the corner of the question. So how to set correct targets in the near future, meaning the long-term decarbonization, but also to have enough resources, science-based approach to achieve them. That will be a, really a challenge in the industry. And what are you thinking of doing to solve this challenge? What, what is your focus right now, your highest priority? To, to start with the right targeting, you you were absolutely right that our sector is currently responsible like for four seven from four to seven percent of GHG emissions globally. So it's it's really a problem, and it's important to have like long term net zero goals. So also to send a message that our, our sector take the issue of climate change responsibly and seriously. But uh, well, as I said, many companies like us struggling to understand the material impacts so that, that their goals are going to have on operations, employees, markets over the next few years. So uh, some companies could not meet their 2050 carbon neutrality targets without investing in their transition strategies today. So we, we need to make ourselves like accountable for progress on our decarbonization strategies in the near, mid and long term uh, distance. So we, we cannot like set ambitions, long term targets as an excuse to postpone re-elections today. And that's why, for example, we and the company are developing our uh, climate strategy with science-based approach and exact detailed for each business unit uh, uh, events and actions that will be undertaken in the nearest three, five years to achieve the long-term also targets. So I think that's the way to overcome it. 
Well, thank you. You've raised the issue of money and financing. So I'm going to turn to Patrick now uh, and ask him uh, what he's seeing uh, as he's uh, focused on this in venture capital. Uh, How are we going to finance these decarbonization strategies moving forward? Patrick? Uh, Thank you. And yes, in venture capital, I'm in the business of funding innovation and, and helping change happen. Um, and and, and the, the big challenge in the difficult sectors is seeing a rate of change which is attractive enough um, to, to seeing enough disruptive innovation uh, that the, the returns can be as attractive as some other sectors such as the IT industry. And um, that might sound like a big challenge, but it really is possible. And I can give you lots of examples. But it's typically made possible um, by government, by change in legislation which changes the rules or by subsidy. So, um, and maybe I should just give you an example. Um, you, you think of the energy sure. industry now as a, an area where innovation is happening rapidly. But if you go back in time, it was a very staid industry. And, and, and the German government changed all that with, with their energy vendor uh, legislation from about 2004. And they, they, through subsidy, propelled change. And it made it a very profitable place to invest for, for some while. And so so getting the frameworks right to encourage innovation, I think, is really key. And do you see a lot of interest in this area? Is money flowing in here? Or is this going to be something that we're going to have to coax people to understand uh, the value proposition, as they say? Well, well. Each sector has its own details. I mean, you, I think you mentioned shipping and uh, as, as one area and, and logistics and transportation as an area which is quite hard to address. Actually, we've just invested in a technology company uh, in the shipping sector. It, it's, it's an AI business called DeepSea, and, and its technology probably makes uh, shipping about 8% more fuel efficient, right? And since shipping is probably about 3% of global emissions, that's a big deal from a small investment. So, so we, we can find niches, but, but finance also brings constraints. So all of our sorts of funds are have certain time spans. We can invest for relatively patient capital. We can invest for five, maybe even 10 years, but we can't invest over very long timescales. So, so one of the issues with hard to abate sectors is sometimes the timescales are just very, very long. But where we where the timescales are right and the innovation is right, then then it can be very attractive. Well, let me turn to Emmanuel, who is working in one of these heavy industry areas, uh, trying to figure out um, what could be done to improve this. Uh, what are you seeing uh, from your spot uh, of working on energy and other issues for Mitsubishi heavy industries? Yeah, thank you, Alice. Thank you for having us uh, today with uh, this very interesting panel. Uh, We, uh, of course, in the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries group of companies, we are on the other side of the fence. We are Mitsubishi is a technology company. So we are enablers and our skills extend from power to infrastructure to transport uh, and all these hard to abate sectors. And the most successful until now one, which is power, are in our field of expertise. And we are coming there providing solutions in, uh, with the aim and the ambition to uh, deliver uh, the, the technology to achieve uh, complete decarbonization by 2050. And uh, honestly, I am thrilled from the response of each and every sector, name it. Uh, I will speak a little bit more on detail on power after, but because you said it already, power has already uh, shown the way to uh, to decarbonize. But uh, uh, the hard to abate sectors, cement, uh, uh, marine transport, aviation, uh, steel, uh, steel industry, metals, ceramics, all this, they are taking very brave steps that we could not imagine 15 years ago. And uh, the challenge there is not on the technology itself, but it's on the creation of stable business condition 
that would facilitate uh, the decision on the uh, investment uh, for zero carbon. So for us, as a technology provider, we don't look for the silver bullet. We don't need the new invention until 2050. What we will need are strong partnerships and the stable conditions to allow the first movers, the first full-scale demonstrations to happen. So let me follow up uh, with you, Emmanuel. One of the things that uh, certainly has emerged recently in the last few years is discussion of hydrogen. I've heard more discussion of hydrogen than I have for many years previously. What role do you see, or is Mitsubishi taking any particular initiative uh, in terms of hydrogen going forward uh, or others, waste heat recovery or CCUS? Uh, specifically that they think are going to be big levers in this area? Yeah, uh, honestly, it's not my first time that I'm dealing with hydrogen. It's the most promising one, but hydrogen has been here in, in, uh, from the past. The last effort to, to launch hydrogen business was back in 2000 when the, the American government launched this international partnership for hydrogen economy. But at that time, uh, the conditions uh, were not mature enough, and the reason was quite simple. At that time, uh, we haven't realized the need for energy storage and decarbonization to happen at the same time. So, yes, hydrogen uh, is the great enabler, as we are calling it, to uh, deliver decarbonization, especially in the hard-to-abate sector, I have an, a perfect example is the steel industry, for example, where we are witnessing through our uh, different uh, technologies what our sister company, Prime Metals, is achieving all over the globe with the introduction of hydrogen to steel making and also to deliver uh, the last mileage of decarbonization. And that uh, would be the use of hydrogen as an energy storage mean. And in between, we have all the different alternatives on zero carbon fuels, uh, uh, clean, uh, uh, carbon-free ammonia, uh, methanol, name it, which are all hydrogen derivatives, I would say. And all these vectors will deliver uh, a significant impact. And in fact, I, I dare to say that decarbonization will not happen without hydrogen. I want to turn to you, Daria, for a moment. You've had a really extensive experience, uh, first as a field engineer and then spending about three decades in another carbon-intensive industry, oil and gas. Now, you're currently Chief Sustainability and Innovation Officer. How does that background fit with what you have done. I'm sorry, that's for Magali. I, uh, incorrectly, that's for you. Uh, please, go ahead and answer. Yeah, I, I recognize my profile. I, I thought it would have been quite <laughs> a coincidence that Daria had the same profile than me. No, I think um, it, having a very strong operational background where I've worked um, in another, like you could call it, um, had to have a sector, but having worked in many countries, I've worked on four different continents in, in operational roles, allows me to really understand the local challenges. And I think today, a bit like Daria was saying earlier, um, it's great to have great targets, but at the end is what you do today that's important. And that's why for us having a 2030 target was so important. Knowing the business and the imperatives that business people have on their day-to-day -day base has really allowed me to understand how to accelerate that implementation. And I think some one mistake that sometimes we make at corporate is that we put our operation people in an impossible position where um, we talked about money earlier, where you have the CFO giving a target and me giving a target, and they are not the same. And uh, then you end up with an operation guy trying to run his business and not knowing if he should please the CFO or if he should please the CSO. And that's something that we work together here with the CFO. We are quite lucky that um, our pathway to 2030 actually 
is not a money intensive pathway because a lot of the thing we do, such as replacing fossil fuels by waste and biomass, is actually good for, for the business because uh, you remove your dependency to fossil fuel. And now I'm not anymore in the oil and gas industry. I'm really happy about it. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so financially, it's actually has got a really good return on investment. And that's how we've looked at it. It's really how to make it a complete win-win because I, I always say sustainability has to be sustainable. And the only way to make it sustainable is that the business has to find a way. And another way to do it is to make sure we position the, our green product in such a way with a price premium, et cetera, that, again, there is an interest from the operation to deploy them. So, so, so I think it's been really, really good asset for me to, to get the credibility I needed to implement that roadmap as, pos- as fast as possible. Sounds like it. That background is really of assistance uh, and during these times where we're trying to make great progress at great speed. And I want to talk to you, Daria, about that for a moment. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that climate change, we used to think that was a threat for the distant future, but it has arrived in very visible ways across the globe, from wildfires in Siberia to wildfires in the American West and the Mediterranean to massive heat waves, as well as a number of storms and storms bearing barreling towards the uh, Atlantic coast uh, this fall. So how does your company account for this growing climate risk uh, and the risk assessment in its planning? Has you, have you developed a greater understanding of your climate risk exposure that can inform decision-making? And that would be on the impact side of climate as well as the uh, any global changes to reduction of emissions uh, approaches there with regulation and other things. What are you seeing? Yeah, that's exactly what we are trying to do during a climate risk assessment. So uh, late in 2019, we did it for like a pli- pilot climate change assessment for one of our business units, and that involved mapping of climate risks, scenario analysis, uh, quantitative risk assessment, and we were following the COD recommendations with that. And we f- we looked for as transition climate risks, so physical also, and we found that the key transition risk was regulatory changes and also possible introduction of payments for direct emissions. The story is that the regions where we operate is currently rather poor regulated and the federal laws are currently being drafted that I house what other speakers were also mentioning. So we are like looking forward for a new legislation to come and the climate change agenda, so to say. And the most important physical climate critical risk turned to be the risk of increased fire forests fire fire hazard and unfortunately country and regional statistics do confirm that the quick frequency and scale of forest fires are increasing and though they have like annual obligatory fire protection measures and and events to mitigate this risk, we already made it um, undertake, uh, sorry, additional steps for that, like uh, unexpected audits to be sure that we have all uh, equipments enough and our staff is trained enough and we do conduct additional trainings together with our Ministry of Emergency just to be sure that we are really ready for this emergency. And though the risk of fires is like yellow in the regions where we operate for ourselves, we we marked it as green for our emergency preparedness. But that's uh, climate risk assessment. That's about how climate change can influence our operations. But the other side is how our operations can influence the climate change. And the end here, just to add an example to decarbonization story, we did really, I think, a major step uh, in this year, in 2021, with the transition of 100 of our energy consumption for renewables. And this enables us to reduce indirect GHD emissions. And we think that the company-wide emissions will be also go down by, by third. And it 
it became possible through our partnership with local supplier, or major uh, Russian hydroelectricity producer. We are rather fortunate, so to say, here because we operate in a region with uh, uh, rich hydropower resources as Russia is the fifth largest hydropower generator in the world. So we are really l- lucky here. And we understand that about 90% of our energy needs we covered by this uh, uh, contracts and so the decision was about the rest 10 and the remaining share we covered by IREC certificates uh, so non-renewable so to say share and with us with that with, uh, we are also supporting the development of Russian renewable energy certificates market as it is rather new uh, in in the country and we we think that these IREC certificates is like a con- uh, temporal financial tool for us until the moment uh, to cover this non-renewable share until the moment we will understand and um, how to go to and uh, have a technology to go to their fully renewable energy share. But still it's, it's 100 uh, energy consumption on renewables. Well, I want to turn to Patrick for a moment. Uh, some exciting developments there that Daria's described. Um, but she's also mentioned regulation. Uh, and, uh, for you, uh, in, uh, your, in venture capital, how do you, uh, see the role of government legislation and regulation in either encouraging industry change and decarbonization or inhibiting it? Uh, well, I think regulation has got a vital role to play in encouraging change. Um, companies will tend to do what, what's most profitable, and a lot of the industries that are we talk of as hard to change are hard to change because they're not. Uh, they have a lot of embedded capital. The, the cost of change is very high, and, and government can change those rules and change that game. It did it in the auto industry, right? We accept the auto industry now as as undergoing radical change. That's been driven by legislation, not by the auto companies. Um, and so, so I think there's a vital role for legislation. And the good news for governments is legislation is cheap, right? It's not the same as subsidy. And the good news for companies is it's durable. And so, and so to the earlier point, we can expect it to last and we can plan accordingly. Uh, and so, so I, I think there's a vital partnership, actually, between governments planning intelligent legislation and setting a framework that makes innovation attractive. And indeed, you know, in some industries now, you have to innovate to survive. And once that bandwagon starts, then that, that attracts um, investors, right? It becomes a place where we expect to find, because of the rate of change, outsized, pro- outsized profit. The, the, the logistics sector, I think, was mentioned as one which has been difficult to change. Um, but actually, legislation is changing it. Uh, a lot of venture capital money is going into it, and it's it's becoming seen as a highly attractive sector. So so change is possible, but it's about setting the rules of the market, if you will. So uh, regulation uh, can prompt behavior. I want to ask you, Emmanuel, what do you think the private sector can, how can it get involved to help scale these technologies? And what are the obstacles to that uh, if the private sector wants to take a lead here? Uh, let me start from the regulation part of, uh, of your statement because uh, I am based in Europe. And in Europe, we, we are um, uh, facing now the new Fit for 55 package from the European Union, which includes a number of uh, game changes, and at least at the, from the intention point of view, regulations that uh, will affect carbon pricing. We have witnessed already the steep increase of uh, ETS prices that uh, uh, the trading system, the European trading system prices, which were a result of a, of a regulation and a regulative intervention. And we have now the the carbon border adjustment mechanism that uh, even from its announcement and without being uh, finalized uh, in terms of implementation, it has created already some uh, global repercussions, I would say, in uh, sector in sectors like uh, cement or steel around around the globe. 
So on the one hand, we have regulation, and on the other hand, we have uh, private money and the private businesses that have to be uh, um, f- delivering uh, some value for the shareholders. So the, the challenge, as you put it, is how to combine two without uh, uh, forcing massive divestment, which is a risk, for instance, if you overdo it in, uh, in, in Europe, and on the other hand, deliver tangible results globally. And I think uh, the effort has to be global and not only focused in, in uh, the advanced economies of the planet. And for that, uh, low-hanging fruits that are, are, are there around the globe, uh, we will have the technologies that uh, are delivering also solid business cases. So um, I, I, I like what I heard about the importance of uh, subsidies, but uh, from me, as a technology provider, uh, I wouldn't advise a, a partner to invest in the technology unless there is a, a solid and uh, healthy business case behind that. And decarbonization will make bi- solid business cases in the future. Uh, I came across some very exciting technology developments on uh, on Lafarge's side, for instance, when talking with uh, your colleagues in Spain or in other uh, in the steel industry in Australia, so around the globe, uh, we will see uh, solid businesses emerging out of the decarbonization. And in fact, that's our strategy as a technology provider. We have put decarbonization at the center point uh, uh, of our business because we feel that decarbonization is not a threat, but it's an opportunity to create sustainable uh, business culture and, at the end of the day, sustainable business cases in a similar way like we do it with artificial intelligence, for instance. So for us, uh, private money is going to flow where solid business cases are there, and we are convinced that decarbonization could contribute, especially in this hard-to-abate sector, into delivering solid business cases. Well, I want to ask each of you in a lightning round here. You're all uh, working with industries that have been around a long time in many instances, and they're probably viewed as somewhat conservative. So what is your best uh, trick or approach for driving innovation in these industries that uh, may not have been known for innovation uh, previously. So I'm going to turn to a lightning round. Anyone want to volunteer? Uh, maybe I'll just, right. I'll just criticize the okay, finance Patrick, industry. Okay, Patrick, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so I'm leaping in. I apologize. But, but um, there's been a lot of talk about ESG in finance, environmental, social, and governance um, as being the, the solution. And, and so, uh, I'd just like to say, I think that's that's hygiene. It's like washing your hands to fight the pandemic. It's useful, but it's not enough, right? And and so, I think for the finance industry, we need to talk about real impact, right? and we need a, we need a better language of really making a difference, um, so that we can uh, relate to, to the, the solid business cases that Emmanuel is talking about. And I think this is coming, and I'm really keen to encourage it. Emmanuel, I saw your hand up. What's your, your response yeah, to that you. one? I, uh, f- thanks a lot, because it reminds me that uh, I have uh, some 30 years of academic experience parallel to the industrial one. So I've spent uh, my, uh, the best years of my life in the academic environment creating new technologies. And I never imagined that I would be in the position in one career span to implement it uh, into real projects. Uh, you know that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the cement industry and carbon capture, for example, is a, a technology that's maturing so quickly that we have never imagined that this will happen. So f- for me, it's a complete excitement. I am thrilled from the chance that this social commitment to decarbonization is offering to make innovation uh, in uh, turn into practice in a time lapse that has never seen before. And that's 
the, the, the massive acceleration of technology deployment of the last 15 years is unique in the, uh, I would say, at least to my experience, into the industrialization of the, of the society. So for me, it's a huge opportunity, and I feel so fortunate that things that I have done at lab scale uh, back early 2000 are now rolled out uh, in, uh, in industrial products, and there are solid business cases behind that. And uh, for me, that's a f- uh, I feel so fortunate, and I think this is a unique opportunity to transform our production paradigm, our industrial culture, into a more sustainable one without losing the living standards or the competitiveness uh, that we have achieved so far. So, Daria, are you experiencing that same kind of excitement uh, as you approach these new innovations uh, with your colleagues? I would like to to see it as an opportunity also. But I think that collaboration is very important here because, well, you know, there are like 17 sustainable development goals, you know, United Nations, and I do really personally believe and like the last one on partnership because I think that really uh, joint efforts can really make a difference. And that's important not to stand alone to face the, the problem, but to have some joint activities to consolidate the efforts. And that's what we have with the global minings, because we have some uh, global associations, like, for example, international councils on metals and minings that push the whole sector, the whole mining industry to the right sustainable and uh, mining with principles, so to say, directions. And it's great to be there because you can have all this knowledge share and also uh, some shared commitments also on climate change, for example. And climate is really recognized to be one of the key topics for the next three years. And through this professional association, we can develop some uh, join programs and activities to help also other miners and encourage companies, industries to, to go on this, on this way and to be brave to set uh, near me than long-term goals on the agenda. Well, thank you. And Magali, I'm going to give you the last brief word here about how you are driving innovation. What levers have you seen work successfully to get your industry to move forward on this important topic? Well, first, I would like to say two words about us being traditional industry. What what was amazing when we did the pledge was the overwhelmingly positive feedback we got from the entire organization. Everybody was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And, and, and I think um, everybody either has a, a great as a kid at home or they, some of them even have read the IPCC report. I think there's such a movement that as a company, if you don't do that, you, you are not going to attract talent. Your people will not be happy to go to work. So it's been really super easy, but we have to act now. So the way we are looking at it is really what can we do today? And the innovation is what will be tomorrow, but we can't be waiting and sitting back for innovation to arrive. But putting innovation and sustainability together has been incredible as well, because then everyone now feels completely motivated. You're not just doing innovation to please a client somewhere, you're actually doing it because that's you want to fight climate change and you know you can do it via innovation. And I fully agree with what Emmanuel was saying. We are living in an incredible period where things are happening so quickly. So I think this journey is is kind of starting, even though it was before, but it's so we are in such exciting time. What we are living at the moment is is history. That's personal opinion. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, It's a very exciting time. There's lots of opportunity. And the important thing is that we take that opportunity and act on it. So thank you so much for our speaker. Really thoughtful insights about how to decarbonize these hard to abate sectors. I want to thank also our, our audience. And I want to ask our audience to please join us for the next session, which will start very shortly. So thank you.